thank you for that great introduction and entertaining. <laughs> and thank you all for joining me here and, and um, <coughs> the opportunity, giving me the opportunity to share with you some of these, I guess, my favorite uh, inspiring facets of the microbial realm, which are the viruses. I'll just uh, start right off and, and lay out a framework for, <coughs> um, I guess, giving context for the different research themes that I've been uh, focused on in the lab. So as, as you could tell from the title in the discussion up to now, the, the major focus of this talk will be my work studying viruses of aquatic microbes. But as Tom mentioned, <coughs> oh, I should make the plug here for the, the members of my lab who have been really instrumental in helping me develop this and keep this theme of research going well through the last uh, three years I've been delving into a different research realm which has been exploring the ecosystem impacts of plastic debris in aquatic systems um, and just briefly I'll, I'll, I'll share that uh, this project itself um, was funded by the Water Center and it was an interdisciplinary team uh, spanning about six different labs on campus and one at the University of Wisconsin Superior and through this project, we developed a new field program in the Great Lakes and spanned, that spanned three different lakes. And as Tom mentioned, trained many uh, University of Michigan undergrads in conducting field work and uh, microbial studies. So I just make a plug there for that's where I've been investing the last few years of work. Um, but for the remainder of the talk, I'll focus on what drew me to studying the nonillion viruses in the uh, the ocean, the, the planetary oceans, and for those of you that aren't up on your uh, terminology of large numbers, that's 10 to the 31, which is the estimate of how many viruses are out there in the ocean, which to give, people always say, you know, this gives you some context, but it still doesn't really help me too much. So if you span them all head to tail, they should span a thousand times beyond our own universe. That gives you an impression of, of mass, or biomass and size. and. <coughs> And I'll present today some of the challenges in getting beyond counting and numbers and just being impressed with the sheer magnitude, but how do we actually study viral ecology? And I think that this theme is rooted in the intersection of these three components, viruses, microbes, and the environment. And I, I, I don't think we can get a, a comprehensive appreciation for viral ecology focusing on one of those components in an isolated fashion. So I, I try to span all of those interactions. And I'd argue that some of the central themes of how we study viral ecology are, come from the same uh, guiding principles of how we study ecology in any system. So we just plug in the word virus. So one of the first things we like to do is uh, seek to understand the processes that are influencing the abundance and distribution of viruses in the environment, any environment. We also look at interactions between viruses and other organisms, as well as interactions between viruses and the processes of energy and matter transformation, in, in that thereby linking uh, all of this, uh, these interactions to ecosystem environmental impacts. And so from these themes, the, the kind of central and, and guiding questions that I ask are, on the one hand, very simple to uh, track abundance and distributions. It's, well, what are we counting? So what is a viral and what is a meaningful viral OTU? As far as interactions, I, the interaction I'm most um, involved in at the moment is the interaction between viruses and their hosts, and in particular the relationship between the respective like viral fitness and host fitness, and <coughs> and finally how changes in virus fitness influence ecosystem function. Now, we've had a number of really excellent seminar speakers over the last years that I. I hope have convinced and relayed to you the fact that microbes rule the world. <coughs> we know this from the biogeochemical perspective and that they drive uh, redox reactions that are essential for life and some of the major, the major elemental uh, cycles on a global scale. And as last year's early career scientist symposium <laughs> exceptionally demonstrated, there are more studies out every day about the importance of microbiomes in understanding both the ecology and evolutionary trajectory of hosts, animals, and, and plants. And that's really gaining a lot of traction um, across all realms of ecology and biology. But 
what I have come to be impressed by fundamentally is the way that these microbes are not autonomous agents. So here's an electron micrograph of a microbial cell that's been completely ravaged by viruses. And these yellow uh, particles streaming out are coming out of a kind of like shrunken dead cell um, with pores whereby the viruses are, are oozing out and lysing, killing the cell. And so while microbes rule the world, it's really these viruses that rule the microbes. And just for a frame of reference, I'll, I'll use the term bacteriophage and phage interchangeably with viruses because of those nonillion viruses in the ocean, the vast majority of them, in fact, microbes because of the sheer abundance of their hosts. <coughs> and just a bit about what they look like. Uh, so many of you, this will be going back to Bio 101, but we have viruses with a, a thin protein capsid where the nucleic acids are, are contained, a tail, and uh, tail fibers, at the end of which are uh, receptor proteins that dock on to recognize uh, proteins on the outside of its host. DNA is injected, genomes replicate, new particles are assembled, and eventually the host lyses. So just to refresh what that process looks like and what's entailed in getting from a single virus to the, its next generation. So how do we study viral ecology? We know they're important in the uh, microbial uh, world, but how do we actually track them and study them? And I think that we can gain a lot of um, appreciation for where the field is. Tom alluded to it in his introduction, but you can see this is the timeline since bacteriophage were discovered nearly 100 years ago. There's pretty much nothing, nothing, nothing until about 25 years ago. And I'll guide you through what these landmark <coughs> discoveries were in the history of uh, viral, environmental virology. but recognize that most of the work has come in the last 25 years and also the intimate connection between technological advancements and what we were able to learn about um, the viruses and how we can track them. So up until about 1989 or 1990, we believed, we, <laughs> I always say that, uh, I was in kindergarten, um, we <laughs> scientists believed that uh, microbes and viruses are <laughs> uh, only abundant in nature ephemerally and were signs of some sort of contamination. <coughs> but at the time, Lita Proctor, a graduate student, went out and sampled the world's oceans and lakes and started looking with electron microscopy at what was there. And what she found in these images fundamentally changed the way that we think about both viruses but also microbes and their abundance and prevalence in the oceans. And these are some of the images she, she brought back. So this is a microbial cell, and you can see these um, sp spherical-looking capsids are viruses. So this is an infected cell in nature, and here are more examples of viruses spewing out of um, single cellular organisms. And based on these numbers, several of these images, she was able to come up with an estimate of 10 million viruses in a single drop of seawater as kind of a universal, stable number. And to this day, that number hasn't changed much uh, with applying new methods for tracking and counting viruses. She could also estimate that about 70% of the microbes, or up to 70% at any given time, could be infected by viruses, which is a which is very uh, important metric, as well as uh, predicting that, considering this and the products of lysis, that there is now the existence of a, a recognition of the existence of significant new pathways for carbon and nitrogen cycling in marine food webs. And in fact, <coughs> time has shown this to be supported. So here's a, um, an ex a, a, a depiction of the ocean carbon budget. And what you see when you follow the, the kind of movement of carbon between different compartments is that the greatest flux of carbon in ocean systems by two orders of magnitude is um, the lysis of plankton by viruses. And if you compare this to, for instance, the burning of fossil fuels or deforestation or deep ocean sequestration of carbon, um, that's actually the two order magnitude reference, it dwarfs those by two orders of magnitude. So this is a significant process that you can imagine anything that's tweaking this flux could be important for the way that we model and predict global scale uh, phenomena. So let's focus in what's happening in this microbial realm 
when viruses are infecting. So take a look at the, the primary producers up at the top there fixing carbon through photosynthesis that typically <coughs> is going to stay, I mean, well, in a simplified view, will move on to heterotrophs or then on to grazers in the classic food chain. But once you introduce viruses and can quantify how many cells, for instance, are infected, we can start get it num getting at numbers of 25% uh, of that fixed carbon actually shunts through, uh, sh is shunted in what we refer to as a, a viral shunt, and that short circuits this fixed carbon, as well as other nutrients and um, uh, energy back into the microbial loop before moving on. So, yeah, it's a force to be reckoned with. And those estimates and models, again, came purely from numbers. So at the time, those were developed in the late 1990s. This is what our view had evolved into of a drop of seawater. Fluor chemistry had evolved to the point that we could identify these tiny particles with a fluorescent microscope. And in a single drop of water, you could simultaneously count and relate the number of bacteria and viruses and small eukaryotes. And in a more thru high throughput fashion and with some like, more robust statistical um, uh, approaches or statistical power, arrive at a number that <coughs> does vary. It's not linear in every environment, in every system, but uh, a ballpark of 10 viruses per every um, bacterium. <coughs> Great, so we have dots, we can count, we can make these global scale predictions about uh, movement of carbon through the systems, but we began to, again, the we, uh, scientists at that time began to wonder whether this is just a blanket metric to apply to all microbial populations or whether some microbes were um, differently affected. Further, understanding kind of rates and influences on rates of infection needed a closer look at the mechanisms underlying these infections. And this we couldn't get with dots and ghosts of TEM images. And so at that point, researchers started cultivating and building uh, cultured phage, phage host model systems that they could explore in the lab. <coughs> One of the first to come out was uh, using uh, Prochlorococcus as a host, which is a numerically dominant ocean phototroph that is responsible for a great deal of oxygen production on a planetary scale. And the first study that sought to isolate those used this approach where you can grow your microbes on a, a bacterial lawn, so that's the green, drop a drop of seawater on it and wait a week or two, and you eventually see these areas of no growth, which are incidents of a single virus landing in that spot and, and killing its host and creating what we call plaques. And from there, you can pull those viruses off and do it again, amplify your number of viruses and have a, a nice culture of a pure clonal virus population. So given it was 2003, the next thing to do, which we couldn't do in 1989, was to sequence this viral isolate. And in the very first, cyanophage, as it's called, phage that infect cyanobacteria, to be, to be sequenced, another paradigm shifting discovery was made in that in this viral genome was a photosynthesis gene, which, okay, the host does photosynthesis. But if you just stop and think about that for a moment, the virus itself, as we discussed in the graduate meeting today, is that really alive? I would argue no, but that's to be debated at another time, or maybe it doesn't matter, which is another um, thing we arrived at. But Nonetheless, the virus itself is not doing photosynthesis. What is this gene doing there? Taking a look at more viral genomes of these uh, cyanophage, uh, we began to recognize that it's not just being passively carried, and it's, it's almost a universal <laughs> phenomenon in almost every cyanophage that's sequenced, at least of the prochlorococcus from the ocean, carries one of these photosynthesis genes. So this is a conceptual model of what happens during infection. You have a virus inserting its genome, genes are transcribed, proteins translated, and you have these proteins produced, and they're not, um, the, the intriguing thing to discover, so this PSBA gene, which is the most widespread in cyanophage genomes, is also one of the most rapidly turned over during infection. And so that, the kind of model that's uh, emerging is that viruses are relieving some of these rate-limiting steps in energy production in the host during 
um, infection, which would then provide the mechanism for you know it, uh, increased fit fitness to viruses that are carrying those. And it turns out it's not just photosynthesis where these genes are um, popping into viral genomes. So th there are uh, genes involved in uh, sulfur, nitrogen, phosphorus cycling as well that viruses carry. And if you think about the impacts of that and how that influences, for instance, rates of photosynthesis, it's important to remember uh, a quote here by Paul Falkowski that small changes in the efficiency of one pathway, especially one responsible for you know, oxygen production on a planetary level, can alter planetary chemistry. So there we are with some cultured uh, viruses and hosts and starting to elucidate some of the mechanisms underpinning this infection and um, some of the neat genes that are carried and <coughs> but at the same time the the, sol the problems are not solved with respect to getting a grasp of the functional uh, and, and functional potential and diversity of viruses in communities because still if we want a snapshot of a drop of water not just the few uh, viruses we can isolate, right? Remembering that less than 1% of the microbes on this image do we have a hope of culturing in the lab and therefore even fewer viruses. We have a very narrow view of how we can use these culture based methods to develop our understanding of viruses. So enters a, um, an approach that has now been wholeheartedly embraced by the microbial community to help overcome this limitation, which is a term metagenomics whereby from a single drop of seawater you can directly um, uh, extract the DNA that's there, in this case viral DNA, and, and sequence it independent of culturing the organism that it came from. And the first proof of concept of this approach came in the early 2000s when sequencing costs were still relatively high compared to what they are now, but it was an excellent proof of concept. So what derived from that study were, was 2,000 sequences of uncultivated viral genomes, which is neat. But from that, the vast majority, 95 or more, depending on which of the samples you look at, were just unknown proteins. There were some diagnostic proteins of stru those conserved structural proteins to convince them that they were looking at viruses, but it's mostly unknown. And if you are following the numbers of the discovery of concentrations of viruses in most environments, you also recognize that 2,000 sequences, that's about the length of um, 20 viral genomes. So you're looking at 20 viruses from the 2 trillion viruses that were in that initial sample. So I'd argue it's still a pretty myopic view of the, the community that's there. But still, it's an incredible proof of concept. But as technology improved and <coughs> methods advanced and cost of sequencing went down, we could apply that at a larger scale. And that's when I finally emerged from <laughs> kindergarten and joined this timeline. So as a postdoc, I developed this uh, high throughput method that kind of got us beyond the limitations of very low yield in, in viral DNA when you do an extraction owing to their small genome sizes. And with this linker amplification method could amplify it in, a, in the least biased way that was possible at the time. And in fact, it was quite minimally um, biased. And thereby, we could use that as a tool to compare diversity and uh, abundance of different genes and viruses across samples. So this is a, just a quick depiction of how we use these short reads that come off of the sequencing um, instruments. We piece them together in what we call contigs, or if you're lucky, these contigs get long enough to uh, circle, circularize um, as the viral genomes most um, often exist. And then we have what we call an environmental genome. Now this, is, this starts to get pretty exciting. You didn't need to culture this, right? So all of a sudden, we can tap into the diversity that's out there in these viral communities without culturing. And we've used this approach to explore viruses in quite diverse and extreme habitats. For instance, these viruses were pieced together, these environmental 
uh, virus genomes and revealed quite novel functions. <coughs> For instance, highlighted here in yellow is a DSR gene, which these viruses were, ice, were uh, these um, metagenomes were generated from uh, DNA collected at hydrothermal vents, and this DSR gene that they contain uh, is a critical, uh, encodes a critical enzyme in sulfur oxidation at these vents where, um, yeah, chemosynthesis is the driving energy production pathway. Okay, that's cool. So the novel function uh, gene carried by these viruses, but what was even more compelling and give gave credit to the kind of <coughs> power of using this environmental genome is now we have organismal context. So in addition to knowing that this gene exists in viruses, I could look at the genome and say, oh, that virus is a myovirus. We don't have it in culture. We can't look at it under the microscope. But based on the genes that are there, I know that is a virus that has a long contractile tail that does that like canonical genome injection into its host. It's kind of spring-loaded, as is this one. But that one up there, that virus, that's, not, that's a completely different family of viruses. That's a, a potovirus with a short tail. This is a cyphovirus with a long tail that doesn't contract. It's also um, known to more prevalently in, uh, insert its genome into its hosts. So these are viruses with very different life, lifestyles and potentially um, ecological implications. But it also tells us this gene was acquired by these viruses, um, uh, by viruses in this environment multiple times. We could apply this tool again of exploring environmental genomes in another uh, interesting environment. These are cyanobacterial mats in a sinkhole in, in Lake Huron, so low oxygen environments. And again, we pieced together the genome and we could identify um, interesting geno genes on this genome, such as viruses that, that degrade uh, proteins that degrade phycobilisomes in their cyanobacterial hosts and presumably use that as a mechanism to scavenge host resources to replicate. Okay, so here we are. We have these environmental genomes. We have organismal context to tell us something about how we should think about the genes that are found in each organism. But might these also be used as a mode to ex uh, define a viral OTU? Because now we have an entity that we can track and count. And so just last summer, the first study uh, generating enough data to do this on a you know, large scale, uh, published a paper describing a comparison of 43 viral genomes. And this came from the Tara Oceans Project, which was a three-year circumnavigation oh, of, uh, yeah, circumnavigation. And we're about halfway through sequencing it and looking at it, describing those communities. So this is a massive data dump uh, of viral sequence data with, with deep enough sequencing that we could begin closing these uh, viral genomes and trying exploring the use of these environmental genomes to do ecology. So as I mentioned, these um, come from 43 metagenomes. I'm not sure if it's working. Hmm. No, it's not advanced. Um, <coughs> using this uh, method that I helped to develop during my postdoc time. And they used so a, an OTU definition that also takes into account the variation from environmental genome to environmental genome. So kind of a, a sliding scale of like, okay, we're going to say that, um, so you can't really see this very well, but around each of these is a gray cloud. And that represents sequence similarity of entities that were assembled from that community. So um, entities that shared 95 percent, on average, nucleotide identity across the whole stretch or across 80 percent of that, that stretch were grouped together, been together in an OTU. And this number derives from some of the metrics that we have from microbial uh, species uh, similarity within microbial species definition. So it's not completely arbitrary, but they didn't, you know, have much else to go with. So this is what they applied. And I'd argue they were able to do some viral ecology. They could track the abundance and presence of OTUs across this data set. And this might be one of my favorite um, figures that have come out of, that has come out of viral ecology in the last years. What this represents is each of these dots is one of those environmental genomes 
that they recovered. And there's a compelling trend here that we see in other systems and with other organisms as well. There's a spectrum. So here at the bottom represents how many stations this dot was found in, this environmental genome, from zero up to 24, and the abundance. And so what they found is that most of the viruses are rare, and a few are quite ubiquitous across the globe. It's not random. So I approached this result in this study by asking, all right, we see this pattern, but is this definition a meaningful viral OTU? And this is where I'd argue we need to take a break from pushing the sequencing of more viral uh, metagenomes or let someone else sequence them. And then I will work in this realm where I now go back into the lab and, and validate those types of questions of what is a meaningful OTU and what can we learn from lab systems to inform that definition and then <coughs> bring it back to the study of viruses in these big data sets to do ecology. So my approach combines model systems with these omics to study viral ecology and address these questions that I posed in the beginning. So back to this, what is a meaningful viral OTU and why we are still in pursuit of one. So you might be thinking, okay, Melissa, I can go to GenBank and I can click on a virus and I get a taxonomy line, right, that goes from uh, viral phylum down to, in many cases, species. So shouldn't that be a virus species? Why can't we, we use this definition? Well, that comes to uh, historical issues in that viral taxonomy is based primarily and still is based on uh, morphology. So each of those classified viruses has a high resolution electron microscopy image that has enabled its placement in the kind of framework that we relate uh, viruses. It also means we have absolutely no way to incorporate into this framework those thousands of viruses that we're now pulling out of environmental uh, metagenomes, so those environmental viruses, which gives a, a, an extremely myopic view of um, evolutionary relatedness between viruses. The other problem is that the viruses have no universal marker gene, so that's a solution that uh, the microbiologists have, have relied heavily on in recent years to generate a framework for understanding relationships between microbes. They look at a single marker gene that's present in all genomes. We don't have that, not even close for viruses. So in pursuit of this OTU, we also have to think about what is a meaningful OTU and how do we convince ourselves that we've found one. <coughs> As with, I would argue, any OTU definition, well, not this component. So we know there's no marker gene, so we need to, and, and we have all these thousands of env environmental genomes, so we need to base our classification on whole genome comparisons, so sequence-based definition. And as with any OTU definition, it should capture evolutionarily cohesive units, so re reflecting kind of the evolution of that unit, as well as ecologically distinct units. <coughs> and I'll uh, walk you through the how I think we can a approach that in, um, with viruses. So this kind of represents what was done in the, in the Tara Ocean's big four billion sequences across the globe study, right? They had all of these viruses or sequences, uh, genome sequences of viruses, and then they drew a circle or grouped them by a different uh, percent average nucleotide identity. And as I mentioned, they used this 95% cutoff, but it could have been 100, it could have been down to 40, it could have been anything. It's pretty arbitrary. But the manner by which we can test whether this is meaningful in light of the viral niche <coughs> um, is what needs to happen next. And in this case, what I uh, use to represent the niche of the viruses is its host. And so in this next slide here, the niche is represented by different hosts, so a blue host and a yellow host. And the way we think about or can think about here viral fitness is the birth size, so how many viruses are produced in each generation. 
in, in this model, we have a, a high birth size, so many viruses up there at the top. Um, the gray scale on this is pretty horrible. I don't know if you can see the other images, but there are some cells with low birth size. This one has only two, but on the same host or in the same niche. And what you see uh, based on a 40% cutoff is that all of these are grouped into one OTU. But a problem arises here in that the viruses of defined OTUs, so this 40% definition, within the same niche have different fitnesses. So that means, you know, let's look at this niche, and these viruses we've said are all belong to one OTU, but some produce five and some produce two, and this one doesn't even have a possibility. There is no infection. So I'd argue in this niche, they have a spectrum of fitnesses. And if we ask the question now, using the 95% the cutoff, <coughs> a different story emerges. So you have three different OTUs now based on their similarity. And now um, the viruses of these defined OTUs are show niche-specific differences in fitness. So within the blue host, you have high fitness of OTU1, and you'll just have to believe me, but high fitness of OTU3 um, in, the, in the orange. And we've captured those with our 95% cutoff in this case. So now I'm going to try this in the lab. <coughs> And so the, the model system I've been developing uh, in for the oceans, uh, I started working with as a graduate student. The host of this system is Pseudo-Alteromonas, which is a, a gamma proteobacteria. It's pretty ubiquitous, but patchy in its abundance. It's a heterotroph, and it's a dominant microbe on ocean particles. When I was sharing this talk with, with non-ocean microbiologists, the first question was always, what's a particle? And so to drive that point home, I'll s share with you this image of marine snow, which I was very impressed with our department's knowledge of marine snow today. So many people brought up this topic <laughs> before I could. Um, if you shine a flashlight into anywhere in the ocean, you'll see a view like this. It's just snow raining down. In fact, over two million tons of carbon falls to the seafloor every day from this process of marine snow sinking. And what is it made up of? Well, poop and dead bodies. That's like something you'll now never forget. And uh, phytoplankton, plankton. And this system that I develop is um, Pseudo-Alteromonas, so it's known to be a dominant microbe on, on these particles. And they're specially, um, they have these special appendages to help them stick to particles. Uh, they form biofilms. They're capable of complex carbon degradation, so they like to eat up the juicy things that are either the particles are comprised of or that their buddies around them are producing. <coughs> They're also, so in, in microbiology, a kind of dichotomy has ar arisen uh, describing the lifestyles of different microbes. So Pseudo-Altermonas, it's very clear to be a, a boom-bust R strategist, and you can pull upon your, your the K versus R strategist thinking that you apply to larger systems as well. It responds quickly to changes in nutrient concentrations, but it's able to persist for long stretches of starvation until they find that juicy piece of carbon to munch on. And it can degrade complex carbon. And it's important to note that of the model systems that are out there to explore viral ecology, um, <coughs> there are three others. And uh, two of them are uh, the, the prototypical K strategist. And so, um, <coughs> I'd argue that my, my system is quite val val valuable in offering insights into modes of existence and impacts of viral infections of this other alternate um, lifestyle host. So in an effort to um, test whether or not this 95% cutoff was meaningful, I looked at eight different viral genomes across um, and, and what I did was just a simple pairwise pairwise comparison and looked for similarity between the genomes. So here are the viral viruses. Those are our viral names. Mine are highlighted in bold. The rest are other viruses that infect Pseudo-Alteromonas. And when you do this comparison, you have high similarity meeting that 95% cutoff. And you can group 
uh, create five groups. So those are five different OTUs. And I called them so respectively. <coughs> and now went in to test whether or how infection phenotypes map to these phage genotypes and whether these OTUs capture the niche specific differences in fitness that I uh, presented in the model. So I used a host range to answer who infects whom to get that uh, needed information. And again, these are the plaques that are generated when you add viruses to a bacterial lawn. And then to measure fitness, I use a metric of infection efficiency, where if you track the number of viruses that are produced after combining virus with host, you can see, okay, da -da -da -da, 60, 80 minutes, boom. Now my culture is full of viruses. I know there was just the first burst of viruses, first generation. I can track how many are produced per cell as well as how long that takes. <coughs> and so the results of the host range analysis, here on the right are the viruses, and here on the bottom are the hosts. And where they intersect with color represents a positive infection. And so you can see those colors group the OTUs we've defined. <coughs> and you can see that the members within each OTU, in fact, have the same host range. So are occupying the same niche in this subset. And the color represents how many viruses were produced. And I'll depict that here. So if we just look at three of the OTUs, one of which represents uh, two viruses, which um, I would love to re repeat this experiment with like an order of magnitude more viruses and hosts, but it's an extremely time and, and personnel exhaustive process, but we'll see what happens in the future. Um, so look at this OTU2 where two viruses are represented and when infecting two different hosts, so occupying two different niches, they preserve their kind of infection ef efficiency within those niches or within that host. So they have the same fitness within respective niches. So I'd argue that this was supporting that 95% cutoff, at least in the, the system that I have in, in my hands. <coughs> and it's a nice example of how we can use these kind of model system lab-based uh, validations of, of metrics to then take it into the environment and explore the uh, kind of distribution of viruses using that OTU definition on a global scale. And so I did that next with these viruses. This line represents the viral genome. Those little dots on the line are predicted proteins, so you're looking just across the genome. These are the reads that came from those, those metagenomes from Tara, and if you just map those reads to the genome, um, uh, based on sequence identity, you get some tiling that looks like that. And on the, on the uh, y-axis represents percent sequence identity. So there at the top are the, the, the reads that are mapping at like 100% going down to roughly 90% there for this one virus of mine from the North Sea. And the color depicts which station the reads were derived from. So where in that global map um, those reads came from. And I did this with the rest of the, the genomes. And I guess the biggest take, <laughs> uh, glaring message to you here is this HS1 virus, which has a ton of reads recruited from one station, which happens to be a, a station in the uh, Southern Ocean near Antarctica. And so bringing, back, bringing you back to then that ecological framework describing the uh, rare versus ubiquitous viruses in, in the Tara uh, data, so this map. I can now contextualize kind of the, or make hypotheses about the abundance and distribution of these viruses that I isolated from the North Sea on a global scale. So I knew overwhelmingly they were poorly represented, except for one, which was represented at one station. And so <coughs> that was that, uh, HS1 there, which would fall way down here in this, uh, yeah, present in one station. And in light of this framework, I would say that these pseudo-altermonis viruses isolated from the North Sea are members of what we can think of as a global phage seed bank, so they're rare members that can pop up in abundance. Now another thing we can do is, so with these impressive um, metagenomes, they're highly contextualized, so 
with each sample where DNA was extracted, we also know a lot of other parameters, and we can correlate, for instance, the abundance of the viruses to other parameters. And in this case, the strongest correlate was uh, chlorophyll that was measured per station. So um, the number of reads that mapped to my viruses correlated most strongly with chlorophyll, and that supports that it could quite be that um, they're just kind of booming where algae is blooming. It's a way to think of it when you have high prevalence or uh, concentration of, of algae. You also have the hosts and thereby the, the viruses, but in an ephemeral kind of way. So to kind of bring you through, I've used model systems, I've used big data, I've used one another to, uh, I've used the, the, the model systems to validate the kind of approach to doing ecology using the big data to answer the first question. <coughs> And I've gone back then to learn something about the distribution of those model systems in an environmental data set. So I've come full circle here and I've um, made some insights into the processes that are influencing the abundance and distribution of these, in this case, North Sea viruses. But there are two other questions that I'm driven by, and in particular the relationship between virus and host fitness and how changes in virus fitness influence ecosystem function. And I'll present to you some work that was recently funded. So this is ongoing work that I just uh, got back from a, a lab in OSU doing some intensive um, work with a coordinated 11 to 12 people needed for running this three-day experiment. So keep that in mind when I present the next data and that it's a lot of work and a lot of human power, which contrasting with now how relatively easy it is to just sequence 200 liters of water and create data, this is very expensive in, in another way, but I would s argue is um, more valuable. <coughs> so back to our framework, and these two other questions will help us eventually, I believe, to integrate knowledge of viruses into kind of Earth system models. And in an idealized fashion, I, I think that in my lifetime, we'll be able to directly use this omics data in these predictive Earth system models, but it will need a lot of kind of iterative validation as I do. So zooming in a little bit closer on these last two questions, what is the relationship between virus and host fitness? Well, that implies that we have, you know, to, to track a relationship, we need to have a way to modulate fitness. And so the way that I do that in my system is by limiting nutrients in the growth media. In particular, I limit phosphate. And nutrient limitation is actually a compelling scenario to model as well in that, you know, in global uh, climate change scenarios, particularly in the ocean, the incidence of nutrient limitation will probably spread and the patterns of that limitation will differ from what we current, as we currently see it. So limitation in these processes could be um, a compelling place to invest research. As far as relationship, you might think, well, okay, let's starve the host, you'll probably get fewer viruses, though you have uh, reduced fitness in the virus as well. Um, but as we've learned from some of the mechanistic understandings of viruses, that the viruses carry some genes that could kind of trick their hosts in saying, uh, no, uh, you're not starving, even though there aren't nutrients around you, uh, and you're gonna keep your metabolism ramped up <coughs> and uh, propagate me. So that was likely not a linear relationship. And then as far as implications of virus fitness on ecosystem function, we can approach that through, well, has been approached through biophysical scaling models where you think about the different compartments involved in infection where you have a host, you have viruses, and you have lysis products after infection. And you can model the kind of stoichiometric ratios across those. But I would argue something um, we should also look at and empirically validate is how those outputs um, vary with changing host uh, fitness landscapes, so a virus and host fitness landscapes. And as I mentioned, this is work that was recently funded by um, uh, offshoot of the DOE. And I walked you through this previously. This is how we measure fitness <coughs> by birth size and um, latent period. And in this experimental setup, I look at two different virus families and a nutrient limited and not limited uh, scenario, and thereby we can measure fitness. But at the same time, I'm really intrigued by recognizing the mechanisms that are driving those fitness differences. And so simultaneously with creating this um, 
massive uh, manual effort of fitness metrics we collect for transcriptomics, metabolomics, proteomics, and high resolution organic matter as biomarkers of the rates and mechanisms of the outputs to the ecosystem under different nutrient regimes. <coughs> and as far as the future work, uh, I'd like to push this towards a more uh, of an ecological stoichiometric perspective in that, as I mentioned, we have these different compartments representing different stages of infection, and there are ways that we can then um, contrast the C to N to P ratios in different nutrient regimes um, to get empirically measure, but also help us predict on a global scale the differences in those ratios. Animation <laughs> fail. <laughs> and inform global Earth system models. And so that brings me back to, again, the, the guiding central themes and the questions that I strive to answer in my pursuit of elucidating all of the unknowns of viral ecology. And thank you for listening. And thank you to this excellent team of uh, researchers that I have been extremely fortunate to work with in the last four years in both uh, the virus and the plastic realm, as well as many um, uh, great mentors on campus. So thank you. So I'm happy to take questions from here. <laughs> yes, Tom? Uh, so in defining the uh, OCU, one of your first questions, you, you're using a measure of the whole genome similarity for uh, a majority of the viral genome. Is that, is that right? Yeah, it's 80% yeah. cut off, yeah. Uh, would it, g given that these genes move around, <coughs> would, would it have you considered the possibility of making the OCUs defined on, for instance, the cyanophage, which uh, photosynthetic gene they carry? So even though they might have different backgrounds, they might have a similar impact on the cyanobacterial world because they are carrying the same gene. I right. Mean, would, would it be useful to think about Like OTUs a system or, or population-specific metric for yeah. OTU to yeah. track? I think that would, it would uh, definitely be useful, though. It's still a, not a, a scenario that every cyanophage has this gene. So I think you could do it in the context of the related units that, that exist. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but, but there, it's remarkable how, uh, how far that we are from having a universal gene carried by even viruses of the same genus. Right. I don't think there's going to be one. Do right. you? No, 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 there isn't. Right. No, yeah. absolutely yeah. isn't. So um, it's just finding this cloud around which to draw around genomes to say, okay, this is a unit that's ecologically relevant. And yeah, yeah. I have other yeah, ideas for how to do that. Maybe, maybe that would be ecological relevance if they carry the photosynthesis. Right, I see what you mean. Yeah, so then you have to think about. Um, so not evolutionarily uh, coherent, mm -hmm. but ecologically. Yep. Uh, yeah, or uh, ecosystem-wise in, in a way, because you could have uh, multiple viruses in fact, uh, occupying the same niche, but you don't have a way to recognize that. And so, um, does it matter that they have a photosynthesis gene or not? Maybe it doesn't if the fitness is the same in the same niche. So I think there's a, a lot of complicating factors there. Yeah, we go. Right. Um, I would say not without some system-rooted grounding. Um, one thing you could think about is some more eloquent ways to link a viral environmental genome with a host in silico, and then quantify that. Effectively, you'd have the same way to monitor niche space occupied and fitness. But it's tricky because when you capture those viruses, you won't necessarily be capturing them during an infection, but there might be ways that you could track that. For instance, I was also developing as a postdoc a, an application of uh, FISH, the fluorescence in situ hybridization, where you can say, okay, I'm going to target this virus gene in this cell, 
And at the same time, I'm going to do uh, 16S RNA fish and say, OK, now I know who the host is. I quote localize those signals that are different color. And I say, oh, the virus I was hunting infects this host. If you have a quantitative way then to track how many viruses in a given cell there are, so how many copies of that viral target are in that cell that I've identified the host, I know the niche, and I know the fitness, then you could start doing that in the environment. And the cool thing about that is um, as part of the funded DOE project, we're working with uh, people at, at um, PNNL to, do, to use their super resolution microscope to <laughs> look at the space fish method. And so with this super resolution scope, you can bypass the card step of fish, which is the catalyzed reporter deposition, and effectively makes fish non-quantitative. So if you can bypass it, then you have this linear relationship between number of molecules of your target and the signal intensity. And so I think we might be able to do that in the next year. So it will be a quantitative way to track how many viruses are in a cell, and you can also identify what cell that is without having the culture either. But it's not necessarily big data omics, but it's, um, it's using sequence d sequences as your target. All we have is what's um, arrived to by modeling, okay. the biophysical, like tracking where we can predict LMSVB based on ra uh, ratios of proteins to nucleic acids. This hasn't been empirically tested at all. <coughs> we need a synchrotron. <laughs> <laughs> Without any questions about the role of cello and so thank you again uh, for joining us and Melissa will be around tomorrow and uh, days after if you'd like to uh, <laughs>